You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for March 27th, 2020. It's not safe for work. In accordance with the Defense Production Act, the factories of the Cornfield Resistance have been running at full capacity to bring you this week's episode of The Professional Left with Drift Class and Blue Gal. Also, we found out this week in the Middle West. Yes, we're in the, there's one big state apparently between the <laughs> Hudson River and Los Angeles called the Midwest, and we're here. The Middle West, the yes. Middle West, just one big undifferentiated blob of country, and we're in the middle of it. And we, that gets to reopen by Easter, apparently, right. so we can go buy Easter brunch buffet, right, at, at a local, Trump hotel, at our local Springfield <laughs> Trump hotel. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we, we're we're shooting for hot spot. You know, we're being left behind by the rest of the country. So, um, oh, well, yeah, well. there's an idiot running the country at the worst possible time for an idiot to run the country, and he's never ever going to get any better. He's only going to get worse, which is pretty much what we've been saying since and the day. he Thirty six percent of the country is going to vote for him in November. Yes, they will. Yes, they so will. So let's. That is our message for today. Is Get with your secretaries of state online. Mm -hmm. Figure out how your area is going to vote in November and make it happen. Well, see, Luke, Al, voting is is brain surgery. It's very complicated. <laughs> no, uh, it's extremely difficult to vote by mail. Uh, it involves checking boxes on a form and then turning that form in and then having it counted. So I'm not sure we can handle doing all of those things in an advanced industrial democracy like our own. Um, although we do already have vote by mail in Illinois, and there are three states that already have vote by mail for their all their elections. That's Oregon, Washington, and Colorado. And we are in the middle of the decennial census, which is delivering forms to every family, presumably. And we're about to get government support checks in the mail, which presumably knows where to find us through the U.S. Mail Service. And we all got Donald Trump's COVID postcard in the mail. We got one in the mailbox and one in the P.O. box, so they found us both ways. And it only takes 270 electoral votes to win an election, a presidential election. So you know what? I think we can do it. I really do think we can do it. But Blue Gal's right. Contact your secretary of state and have them spend whatever's necessary and do whatever's required to have vote by mail in your state. And your congressman is up for re-election yes. in November, no matter who they are. Yes. So get them funding a vote by mail for your area and for your state. Mm -hmm. And and all elections are local elections. We understand that there are local election boards. You understand the secretary of state for your state is involved in, in the voter rolls and so forth. I did have someone on Twitter that, I mean, all week, and I think this is important, uh, everyone needs to sort of put some calming powder on your nerves because mm -hmm. the, everything is very tense right now. Yep. And not just snap. It's hard, but. And I've I've done it myself this week, and I I know what it's like. Just not to work. It's hard not to snap at people from time to time. If I kept a catalog of all the tweets I deleted before I hit send, <laughs> I would have a compendium of some of the yes. most glorious swearing you've yes. ever heard in your life. Someone was talking on Twitter about we need to do vote by mail everywhere, and we need it universally, and so forth. Yeah. And a young woman who, bless her heart, and I don't mean that in the fuck you Southern sort of way, I mean it literally, said, replied, yeah, but who's going to decide who votes? Yeah. And well, this, there you go. Uh, the same group that always decides the secretary of state for your state, mm -hmm. your local voter registration people. Reg it will be for registered voters only who will get a ballot in the mail. And having to explain that to someone, uh, when... And I don't want to, I don't want to brag. I don't want to say when you're at my level, you know, yeah. but I've, this is my 10th presidential election. Yes. I've been at this for 40 years. Yes. You know, you and I have done voter registration drives yes. and so forth. And it's just, you know, know about uh, right. registering to vote by mail and registering mm -hmm. to vote online and so forth. This has been an issue for us for a long time. Yeah. And you do, you do have to 
in every in so many cases, folks, you have to bring people along. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is especially true for liberals. We have to bring people along. And everyone's going through their own sense of grief or mourning or having their own problems. Mm-hmm. I was I was so grateful this week, and then I'm going to let you talk to your class. <laughs> well, thank you, darling. <laughs> uh, we got a uh, an email from a listener. We had a little bit of a back and forth, and and grateful to hear from him, who said, "You know, times were tough before the coronavirus." <laughs> mm-hmm. And I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. You know, yeah. time, the, the the Trump administration has been awful." Since they were inaugurated and before. Yes. So this is not new. This is just a crisis that uh, is making, is changing the world forever. You know, yes. this is one of those seismic shifts in how everything is done. Well, and you and Junior Dude had a talk about that. You mm-hmm. know, that this, is, mm-hmm. this is not another crisis. This is the defining crisis of this generation. Right. And it will At change the it, world. We hope it's not. We hope it's the last defining crisis of this generation. Yeah. I kind of have a feeling we're in from several other crises. We'll have a few uh, more. Yeah. But one at a, hopefully one at a time. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, this one is tough. And this one is going to shift the way things are done. There mm-hmm. will be new technologies. There will be new ways of going to work. Uh, I do recommend if you're actually working from home for your boss, mm-hmm. uh do the best job you can because mm-hmm. uh, chances are you're going to be able to make a case for telecommuting for the rest of your on life. a regular basis for <laughs> yeah. the rest of your life. Yeah. Right. That this mm-hmm. is not going to go back to three hour commutes, 90 minute commutes because no. it wastes too much time. It does. Um, and it's, it's very inefficient. It's an inefficient way to do business when we have this technology mm-hmm. and all of these things that were impossible before. We can't possibly have people work at home and be able to supervise them. And we can't possibly have people work at home and, and feel that they're contributing. And, you know, you can, you can work two days a week at the office and three days a week at home. You can do all kinds of things. We're, we're discovering that all kinds of things are possible. People who we never thought were, would question, wow, it's really stupid to have health insurance connected to employment when 3 million people apply for unemployment in a, in a week. So I'm sorry. No, that, right that, on. <laughs> no, that's, I mean, back when I was a programmer, like four careers ago, mm-hmm. um, the dream at the time was, Programming from the beach. You could live on the beach. You could sit on yeah. the beach and do your work and and some which way you, of course this was pre Wi Fi, pretty much pre Wi Fi. Uh but somehow, some way you would you you'd have one of those expensive newfangled laptops with the batteries that lasted ten minutes. And you could sit on the beach and do your writing and do your coding and submit your work, you know, over the telephone line, uh, war game style when you got home. And that would be the future and it'd be glorious. And then, you know, somebody figured out, wait a minute, when you can digitize something. It doesn't have to be you on the beach. It can be some person in the Pacific Rim on a beach yeah. or in an office. In fact, thank you. Your job is now gone. Like, oh, didn't think that through. Really just mm-hmm. didn't think that through. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, this is, this is, first of all, yes, it is, it is now time to think about what happens when you tie health care to employment, which is pretty much what the left has been saying for a very long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, we would like to call your attention to the fact that this is the 10th anniversary of the Affordable Care Act. And that even as Americans are going through a plague year, a genuine old fashioned medieval plague year, um, there are still Republicans. The Trump administration is still working to destroy the Affordable Care Act via the courts. In they're, court. working, they're working to take Healthcare away from millions of Americans during the middle of a plague, including I, us, including us, including, including us, including you and me. That's not stopping. That's that's gone. That's that's not being reported because there is no news but but Corona news these days, and that's entirely appropriate. But this is it's been ten years, and ten years ago, it was a half a loaf, and it was terrible, and and it cost the Democrats seats, and it was oh my god, it was it's not what we wanted, and there's and it was an imperfect bill. And the whole premise was, yeah, it's imperfect. You're right. It's imperfect. And it leaves a whole bunch of stuff intact that we don't like. But it it establishes healthcare as a right, and it's a first foundational stone upon which we will build future healthcare getting towards universal coverage. So please, if you are a person of goodwill, 
and and I know that our listeners are, and I know most right. people are. Right. If I'm not walking around with Medicare for all or bust tattooed on my head, that does not mean I want to see people die for lack of health care. Right. That just means I understand how hard it was to get even the Affordable Care Act through and that opposition to it, really relentless, well-funded, ruthless, um, despicable opposition to it has been nonstop for a decade. Mm -hmm. And that over mm -hmm. the course of that period of time, the the favorability rating, as long as you don't call it Obamacare, the favorable ability rating has gone up and up and up till over a majority of people go, you know what? This is not a bad idea. This was this was not a bad idea. This actually works. It works for me. It works for my family. It doesn't go far enough. That was the part about the polling during the during when the ACA was was done. It was so incredibly dishonest. Mm -hmm. it, it was polling mm -hmm. about are you satisfied? Are you happy with? Do you, do, what do you think of it? And the majority of people don't like it. Well, if you bother to sort of de differentiate, if you bother to break the numbers down further, it was like yeah, a whole bunch of Republicans hated it because the black guy was doing it. But a whole mm -hmm. bunch of liberals hated it because it didn't go far enough. Right. Now, those two positions are not compatible with each other. One thinks millions of people should not have health care at all. One group thinks millions more. Everyone should have health care. So the Affordable Care Act was an unhappy compromise, but it didn't mean people hated it for the same reason. And that's why you have to be very careful with how liars use numbers. Yes. Um, and yes. speaking of liars using numbers, that's been pretty much what the Donald Trump press conference has been every fucking day. Um, I absolutely don't want to talk about him in this. I hour. don't either. I, I don't either. <laughs> we may have to brush lightly against him. Exactly. Um, yeah. But it's it's uh it's it, if I had to imagine a science fiction you know apocalypse uh, story about the worst possible case scenario, it would not be a plague. It would be a plague with the least qualified lying lunatic in charge of national response, surrounding him or herself with the most disqualified bunch of boot licking assholes imaginable. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That that would be my worst case. And, and, and as I told a friend on, on the Facebook today, who was talking about science fiction, yep, we're living in a science fiction novel. We're now, mm -hmm. and maybe we should marshal those resources, the people who know how to think these things through, um, to to talk about what's come what will likely come next and after that and after that and after that because you know we're thinking a day at a time a week at a time right now as I'm sure you guys are too um, we're getting groceries by the week <laughs> yes as, as as we discovered I will be a little late for Sunday school by the way um, in not in person we're, we do virtual Sunday schools now and they're very successful and I, everyone appreciates them uh, but the the first open slot to go pick up groceries in our area, which is not a major metropolitan area, which is Springfield, Illinois, was a, a week from the day I ordered them. So mm -hmm. that's fine. We'll we'll get we'll get by with that. So um, nine nine a.m. Sunday from boom. ordering it last Sunday. Yeah, I'll be there. Was the earliest time, so he's going to be late for Sunday school. I'll be Adult there. Sunday school. Yeah, you know how it on goes. Zoom on Zoom. <laughs> I Zoom Sunday school, and everyone. Oh, by the way, we should mention that middle child. <laughs> Middle child taught the mayor of our town how to use technology today. So she did. She really her, did. Her mayor's Youth Council. Mayor's Youth Council. He was having that problem that some people over a certain age who have never used technology before have, which is, I don't know how to make this work. I don't know how to turn on my my laptop camera. Yeah, that That's, was what he did not know how to do. So it was just a and picture she of his smiling him face. through it. She did tech it, support. It was a yep. picture of his smiling face, and I don't know how to do this. And she remotely talked him through it because she's on the mayor's youth council and save the day. And now she's uh, her group um, led by her. Let's face it uh, is, in, <laughs> is in charge of um, the mayor's Instagram account. Mayor's youth council, Instagram, yeah. right? It's yeah. youth of Springfield. Anyone that's on Instagram that wants to go and look at uh, middle child's cooking. She's right. showing how you can cook vegan meals during uh, the quarantine, during yes. the, uh, stay in place part of life. She is cooking up a storm. We ate uh vegan. Uh, I'm not even going to say what it is because I know some people can't get this food where they right. are. It's very good. It's so good. <laughs> she, she did a but great it, job. Yep. yep. It was delicious. So, and pancakes were included. So vegan pancakes. Yeah, she included. made vegan pancakes and vegan tofu scramble. And mm -hmm. she you had you have all this fresh fruit in the refrigerator. I Thank do. you very much. Mm -hmm. She laid she she's a natural born food stylist right. and uh and a, she, did and a a she did a great job. And she's bossy, so it's like she's okay. She's very bossy. Yeah. Do, it's like 
you know what? Can we just put you in charge of the country? Because you're yeah, you're all about no. keeping people safe and telling people what to do. Well, um, and let let's give her credit. Yeah. She is the oldest female in a house with a handicapped sibling. So yes, being yes. bossy and being able to cook and all those skills that she has are in part because she was absolutely required to be that person. So yes, she was. we love her. Yeah. And uh, so. Um, so we talk about people who are not doing well, who are not reacting well, who are not <laughs> competently carrying our, out the duties of their office. Is, right. Our full house is pretty uh, stable and calm because I think because you and I have worked from home since 2012. You know, you've yeah. been here. Yeah. Uh, and so it wasn't a huge change to be able to have to say, mom's working right now and you have to go. Yeah. So that, that, that there has no, been no adjustment in that regard. There's, um, there's been a little bit, there's a little yeah. bit of kind of, cause we're, it's a small house and there's five grown ups in it, basically grown ups in it yeah. and, four, and yeah. three cats. Although we, we keep hearing about a fourth cat that we're going to get that we're not going to get. We're not going to get no. And just no. sort of threading through our work that we do during the day with the kids who are now in the house is a little more um, logistically interesting, but we get it done. Yeah. Um, well, want... and, and when youngest child said, I want to go to school so bad, yeah, like, wow, you wow. and I just cracked up. Note this on the calendar, <laughs> write yeah. this day on the calendar. Um, and I should note that, yeah, we were talking about when, when I moved down here, when, when did I come full-time to Springfield or part-time and commute? And it's been a number of years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I've been podcasting down here for a long time, uh, not quite the full decade we've been servicing the public, but the eight years of those 10 years, I've been podcasting from right where I'm sitting right now. Right. And right now the New York times has discovered podcasting. Um, and, and they're just, they're just gushing over this technology, this, this sort of intimate technology, uh, that, that you can do to communicate and all these people who are normally used to like whole studios and, and, and staffs and crews are adapting by uh, adjusting to, uh, to, to doing their job by recording it from home. Wow. Yeah. And, and so now they're, <laughs> and it's just amazing what you can do from home and look at these people yeah. with pictures of them, et cetera. And I, I must say just, if you were to read their article from outer space, you would assume mm -hmm. that podcasting originated in New York city about a week ago. About and, a week ago. <laughs> and it, it, it is confined entirely to the greater New York metropolitan area, that yeah. no other podcast exists anywhere, um, and that these sort of bold pioneers have discovered the, the joys of sitting under a blanket or having your head in a closet, which is literally what I am doing right now, um, talking to people and, and, and having their feedback come back to them and doing sort of not quite real time, but having a real conversation with real people. Right. So I've taken a, a few pictures of my – of the global headquarters of the uh, – professional web podcast <laughs> that i will post up on my blog and probably part of the podcast uh just Great. to let you all know that no out here in the middle west which is middle apparently west, the, don't middle, forget. The, the giant amorphous <laughs> blob of state out here uh we've been doing this a really long time and we understand that new york is getting the shit knocked out of it right now we're right, not right. we're not laughing at anyone happening living through that we we listened together and cried together over andrew cuomo's speech today andrew cuomo's speech today and i'm actually going to put it in the podcast it was, it I'm was gonna, six minutes of it in the podcast it was lovely it was brilliant it was heartfelt it was henry v people have said that it was henry v yeah and this is the yeah. sort of thing that people used to gather around the radio and listen to fdr do yep. um you yep. know give them hope during desperate times and well, let's, let's listen to that right now. I'm going to put that in the podcast right now. Okay. And I want to make two points to you. And I want to make two promises to you. This is a different beast that we're dealing with. This is in, an invisible beast. It is an insidious beast. This is not going to be a short deployment. This is not going to be that you go out there for a few days, we work hard, and we go home. This is going to be weeks and weeks and weeks. This is going to be a long day, and it's going to be a hard day, and it's going to be an ugly day, and it's going to be a sad day. This is a rescue mission that you're on. The mission is to save lives. That's what you're doing. The rescue mission is to save lives. And as hard as we work, we're not going to be able to save everyone. 
And what's even more cruel is this enemy doesn't attack the strongest of us. It attacks the weakest of us. It attacks our most vulnerable, which makes it even worse in many ways, because these are the people that every instinct tells us we're supposed to protect. These are our parents and our grandparents. These are our aunts, our uncles. These are a relative who is sick. And every instinct says, protect them, help them, because they need us. And those are the exact people that this enemy attacks. Every time I've called out the National Guard, I've said the same thing to you. I promise you, I will not ask you to do anything that I will not do myself, and I'll never ask you to go anywhere that I won't go myself. And the same is true here. We're going to do this, and we're going to do this together. My second point is, you are living a moment in history. This is going to be one of those moments they're going to write about and they're going to talk about for generations. This is a moment that is going to change this nation. This is a, na a moment that forges character, forges people, changes people, make them stronger, make them weaker, but this is a moment that will change character. And 10 years from now, you'll be talking about today to your children or your grandchildren, and you will shed a tear because you will remember the lives lost, and you'll remember the faces, and you'll remember the names. And you'll remember how hard we worked and that we still lost loved ones. And you'll shed a tear, and you should, because it will be sad. But you will also be proud. You'll be proud of what you did. You'll be proud that you showed up. You showed up. When other people played it safe, you had the courage to show up. And you had the skill and the professionalism to make a difference and save lives. That's what you will have done. And at the end of the day, nobody can ask anything more from you. That is your duty to do what you can when you can. And you will have shown skill and courage and talent. You'll be there with your mind. You'll be there with your heart. And you'll serve with honor. And that will give you pride, and you should be proud. I know that I am proud of you. And every time the National Guard has been called out, they have made every New Yorker proud. And I am proud to be with you yet again. And I'm proud to fight this fight with you. And I bring you thanks from all New Yorkers who are just so appreciative of the sacrifice that you are making, the skill that you're bringing, the talent that you're bringing, and you give many New Yorkers confidence. So I say, my friends, that we go out there today and we kick coronavirus ass. That's what I say. And we're going to save lives, and New York is going to thank you. God bless each and every one of you. All right. Now, um, now, those are the people who are doing well during this period. Yes, there are right. people who are not reacting well and not living up to their leadership. Uh, I'd like to put Jerry Falwell Jr. at the top of that list. 
honestly, who has decided to turn the Liberty University Segregation Academy, because that's what it is, uh, into a coronavirus hotspot, because that's very Christian of him. Um, well, and let's be clear, too. It's a profit center for Jerry Falwell Jr. to yeah. take student loan money yes. from the federal government. Yes, it is. So what you're seeing over and over again with the people that are really super urgent about let's reopen the economy, let's reopen our our academy, right. quote unquote, let's reopen restaurants and hotels because I'm Donald Trump. I need money. I need money. My, I'm losing money. Uh, they're doing it because... Money means more than people. Mm -hmm. And and we saw that over and over and again. This is number one on my hit parade for both sides don't. Mm -hmm. People who say, well, you know, it two percent of the human beings in the United States is worth it. Is ex are expendable. Are expendable. Right. Right. In order to make sure our economy I mean, really, what's the cost that we're gonna have to pay? You know, you know. And guess which party? It's not the Democrats. No. And then and then the, the, the argument of why can't both sides just get together and cut the checks and give people enough money to live on? Why can't we get both sides just doing their jobs and working together? And yeah. I had to remind one of them, which party is actually recommending that? Yes. Which party would pass that immediately yes. had they the power to do and it? And which party held this country hostage mm -hmm. for days, for a week, over... The five hundred billion dollars slush fund they wanted to give right. Donald Trump to spend, however right. well, and of course, and, and not reveal anything about it until after the election. And I crack open my newspaper today and and uh, local paper and see a full column op-ed by Mark Thiessen, torture pimp Mark Thiessen, who is still employed for some reason, talking about how Democrats are holding the country hostage over for partisan reasons. Democrats and and here's the thing: we know the playbook. Okay. Yep. We on the left have lived through this bullshit Republican playbook over and over and over again. And honestly, uh, you know what? I know it. And of course, again, we're in the Middle West, the middle of the country, so we don't technically mm -hmm. exist. But shame on Democrats and shame on wealthy liberals. If you haven't figured out, he, they've handed you the playbook. This is how they're going to behave. This is what it's going to be. They're going to lie about it and lie about it until it's too late. Then they're going to blame everyone but themselves. Then they're going to complain that both sides aren't working together. And then they're going to complain that this is not the time to judge who was wrong about what. And while we're busy not judging them, they're going to sneak around behind us and knife us in the back and repeat it mm -hmm. and repeat it. That's and the right. mainstream media is going to go along with it every single fucking time. Both so, sides with both siderism. Yep. That, yep. And now that you all know the playbook. The question is, what are the people with the really big megaphones going to do about it? Mm -hmm. And that's a because mm -hmm. I know we've been shouting our heads off for a decade now on the podcast and 15 years of writing. And it's time for everyone else with a much larger megaphone to get in the game, to stand up and be counted. Because it's it, it the reason this is going to be as bad as it is, is the Republican Party. There's right. just no two ways about it. Uh, it was kind of funny to see Justin Amash. Uh, the scales slowly falling from his eyes again. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. and, and wondering that golly, maybe the motivation for the tea party was something other than being deficit hawks. Maybe it had something to do with some other motivating factor. Maybe it was because of the black guy who was running. Maybe it was a GOP rebranding scheme all along, mm -hmm. but it's like, Oh God, mm -hmm. what he's, he wanted to, where's all the deficit hawks. Now that Republicans want to spend half a trillion dollars on a slush fund to give to the worst human being on earth right now to spend however the fuck he wants. Why, where are all you heroes out there? Again, I'm reminded of the streaking scene from old school, you know, <laughs> where Justin imagines the last true libertarian go, come on guys, the whole tea part. Wait a minute. Where did everybody go? Where did everybody, well, there yeah, were, I thought we were all on government spending and balancing budgets. Yeah. Oh, yeah, wait except a minute. If you'd listened to liberals, you might've noticed it was all a lie. It was all a lie. And I, I would mention also, there's a, um, there's an article in the New York times. I'm going to write up later today, pushing a book that's going to come out in a month or two by the Niskanen Institute, I believe, uh, talking about the heroism of those never Trumpers. Uh, how <laughs> if only we, quote if unquote, only we'd listen to if only we had listened to all, all 12 of those never Trumpers when they <laughs> talked about what an unfit boob Donald Trump was. And and sure, they're, they're the small in numbers, but by God, they were sure right about him. And and maybe we should have paid more attention. And, and I just sit there just holding my head 
trying not to have it burst apart like an overripe melon going, yes, after grudgingly admitting that Donald Trump was horribly unfit and backing every other person who was marginally less unfit than he was, even though he's a manifestation of the party they helped build for the last 40 years. And, and pitching third party bullshit and let's not vote bullshit. And finally grudgingly saying, well, maybe I'll have to vote for Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah, I was going to say, as as upset as you might be about being ignored mm-hmm. in favor of the never Trumpers, think of how Hillary Clinton oh God. failed. Oh God! And and I don't see the Ninskin Institute publishing a book saying, by the way, we should have elected Hillary Clinton. By the way, we should have listened to the fucking liberals all along. Yeah, um, right. But it was this, and I read the whole um, uh, op ed. Doesn't mention the Democratic Party once. Doesn't matter, mention liberals once. It mentions Hillary Clinton, uh, but it's really just this sort of pay-in to the heroism and foresight of the never Trumpers who suddenly noticed that the Republican party was full of Republicans five minutes ago and freaked out. Yeah. And again, did, did everything they could possibly do not to support the Democrat until the last yeah. possible minute. And then very reluctantly said, well, I guess we're going to have to do that. I guess we're just going to have and to the do the extent that. to which the, the mainstream media and the never Trumpers ignored issues altogether. Yes. I, I was grateful to that. Someone posted, photographs of the pages of stronger together hillary clinton's campaign book which Mm -hmm. nobody ever reads those things but it's nice to go back (laughs) and realize that she had pages in that book about pandemics and what needed to happen yes and they were you know understanding that it's a part of government policy to handle these kind of things yes and we missed out and now we have uh a nut job and i i put in our notes drift glass Mm -hmm. Because you had this whole cornered rat thing going on yeah. of President Cornered Rat <laughs> screaming into it. First of all, uh, less than 24 hours ago, he told Sean Hannity that New York didn't really need more ventilators. Right. That was less than 20. Uh, from, the, from the moment we're podcasting, this, this was yeah. last night, literally last night, right. Donald Trump last was saying, and he was also saying that, you know, they, states who get ventilators based on how nicely the governors treated him. And he didn't the governors really, of the states treated him yeah, personally. You know, this is a yes. two-way street. They got to treat us right. They got to treat me well. So however nicely, they, however much they kiss his ass, that's how much government health they're going to get. And he decided he didn't need to invoke the Defense Production Act that forces country to do this. And last night on state TV, he said, I don't believe you need 40 or fifty or forty or 30,000 ventilators. Right. And so then this morning, he's tweeting in all caps, General Motors must immediately open their stupidly abandoned Lordstown plant in Ohio or some other plant and all caps start making ventilators now exclamation points like six of them mm-hmm. and uh, Ford get going on ventilators fast all caps. Mm-hmm. Uh, but here's the timeline on that because uh-huh. there is a there's always a timeline for his little brain. Right. And I know I don't like to talk about Trump today, but. I think the timeline is important because it involves Fox News and we want to destroy Fox News. Yeah. Trump is temporary. Fox News can be temporary, too. The timeline is he heard from a quack doctor on Fox that having so many ventilators when they're so expensive would be surplus and surplus is bad. Right. So immediately he went when he was it was time to go on Hannity, which was scheduled. He'd been watching Fox. And he went on hand and he said, oh, you know, we don't need he, he carried on the theme of what Fox News was saying, because this is what works for Trump is to repeat what Fox News is saying. And then Fox News viewers say Donald Trump is saying what I'm thinking, because what his viewers and and believers are thinking is what Fox News told them. So he's the perfect Fox News candidate because he repeats what Fox News says. And then his voters say, oh, wow. He's saying exactly what I've been thinking all along. Yes. He goes on Hannity and says, yeah, too many ventilators. I believe that we don't need 40,000 or 30,000 ventilators. Sure. This morning, he heard from everybody on Twitter that he sounded like a psycho for saying that. Right. Because people are dying. Mm -hmm. And there are, even during, this was interesting, even while he was talking on Hannity because he was on the phone, the B-roll that was running on Hannity while Trump was talking was healthcare workers wrapped up in garbage you know, bags. Gar- garbage bags, yeah. exactly. Uh, and it was medical, 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 and people in hospital garb. So 
the visual that was there was not reinforcing Donald Trump's message that you don't need ventilators. Mm -hmm. So now that everybody is telling him he sounded like a psycho, he starts yelling at Ford and GM. Right. To get going right now. Do it right now. Right now. Do it right now. And and because above and beyond everything else, Donald Trump is incredibly stupid and incurious Mm -hmm. and doesn't care about anyone or anything on this earth but himself. He sees everything as a function of TV ratings or hotel occupancy. Right. And right. so if we have a surplus of something, that must be bad. If we have the theoretical positive, he's, look, he's used to overbooking shit. You know, that's his idea of successful is having too many customers for too few things. You know, right. I, right. I, I, we, we overbooked the Trump hotel. That's a good thing. Um, he doesn't understand that everything isn't hotel occupancy and – the ratings he's worried about are human beings who are dying. Mm -hmm. And that's why he parked that ship off the coast and didn't let them come onto American soil because those numbers would have counted against him and would have looked bad. And it is just maddening. Not that this horribly unqualified narcissistic monster is in charge of things, but that 36, 37 percent of this country looks at this cornered rat, this deranged cornered rat and sees a great leader who they really want to reelect and who will and who swarm social media to defend everything he does. That's the part that just scares the hell out of me, because you're right. Trump is temporary. Fox needs to be temporary. And the Republican Party needs to have its propaganda pumps shut down for the Mm -hmm. public good. Mm -hmm. They're now in the business of poisoning the public well during a time of crisis. And that needs to be the subject of many, many, many lawsuits against against communication corporations like Fox News and against right. people like Rush Limbaugh on the radio. They're, they're giving people deliberately false information during a health crisis, and that has got to be against some law somewhere. Yeah. And, and there was – this isn't in our notes, but there was a, a FOIA request that was – answered of uh, Betsy DeVos's emails, but her emails yes. this week uh, that got buried under coronavirus news. But uh, you will not be surprised to hear that Fox News promised Betsy DeVos easy interviews every time she went on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that they were discussing uh, certain TV hosts on Fox being brought in for the cabinet positions. Mm-hmm. And uh, all... And and these emails, but her again, but her emails uh, of on Betsy DeVos's server because it's government, it's subject to FOIA. We need FOIA of every single Republican member of the Benghazi committee mm-hmm. and their emails and texts. Mm-hmm. We need every baby parts email from Marsha Marcia Blackburn mm-hmm. and who she was talking to on Fox. We need to expose this network for the propaganda wing of the Republican Party that it is. And then we need an FCC with teeth to take away their license yeah. because they're not news. Looping back to Jerry Falwell Jr. for one second, sure, the fact that he's sure. a junior. Jerry Falwell Jr. is the son of Jerry <laughs> yeah. Falwell, who has, has long uh, gone and not lamented at all. But this is by way of reminding you that Ronald Reagan – was the person who opened the door of the Republican Party and let in Jerry Falwell, welcomed him with open arms, sat with him, laughed with him, joked with him, let him have a seat at the table. And a generation later, it's Donald Trump and Jerry Falwell Jr. This is not the third year of the Trump presidency. This is the 40th year of the Reagan revolution. And that's the problem. It's the 50th year of Trump's of, of Nixon's Southern strategy. We've repeated it over and over again, but it bears repeating mm-hmm. again. This is has been going on for decades. And all your Republican friends, all the come to Jesus people, all the, oh my God, could, can you believe this got so bad, have spent their entire adult lives lying to you, lying to me, lying on television, lying to themselves about their own goddamn party. The one thing they were supposed to know about is the one thing they've been lying about for money for decades. And there's mm-hmm. no reason in the world with 3.3 million Americans losing their job that Laura Ingram still has a job. Or Dan Henninger right. still has a job. Or Mark Thiessen still has a job. Those people are active um, threats to public health. And the fact that they're in my local newspaper, the fact that they're on television, the fact that Dan Henninger, the, this lunatic, has a column in the Wall Street Journal, is an offense to everything. Is an offense, certainly an offense to journalism. And if you are still a journalist out there anywhere, um, I'd like to very much know what you and your organization are planning to do about purging 
the ranks of your profession of people like that because they're hurting mm -hmm. all of us. And you know what? If you don't clean up your own house, we're going to assume that you're okay with it. And if you're okay with that, then you're part of the problem. Yep. You're okay with people calling it a hoax for two months mm -hmm. and more. Hey, Drift Class, which is worse, Louis Gomert or an empty podium? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'd have to say Gomert uh, because you can always wipe down a podium and someone else can use it. But Gomert will always be Gomert um, <laughs> no matter what you do. Uh, today, Louis Gomert was on the floor of the, the, the house, I believe, um, saying that, quote, there are fewer people with the disease, which is a lie. With the disease. And his solution is, it's time to turn back to the God that too many have turned from, by which he means Donald Trump. So, Which means, no, he mean, he's talking directly to his idiot voters. Yeah. yeah. That's the only person he's talking to, and he's up for re-election in November, folks. Mm -hmm. You, don't you need could to, get rid of him, you don't but you don't. That. You don't need to live with that thing around your neck. You, don't, you know what? Getting to a hospital is going to be very, very, very difficult. Getting rid of Louis Gohmert's easy. Easy. It's like lancing a boil. Back in the old days, <laughs> you walk into a hospital. You walk in, you vote, or, or you vote by mail, and then he's gone from your life yeah. forever. You can get rid of these clowns. Matt Gates can be gone in a trice. It's easy. Matt Gates is not forever. These people, all you have to do is is vote them out of office. It's just that simple. And with vote by mail, you can do it from home. I would like to point out that we have another podcast. Yes, and it, we had two episodes come out this week. You so, well, you know, defense oh, listen. Defense yeah. Production Act requires that we produce lots of podcasts every week. <laughs> so, our other podcast, which is a great podcast, by the way, every other podcast says that about this Don't stuff. Tell people what it's called, so they know where to go look for it. It's Science Fiction University, right? And uh, traditionally, we can say that now that we've done a few, we compare a novel to a movie. Uh, not the same thing, but in the same theme and, and discuss plot and character development, what makes it science fiction, what makes them classics. Uh, this week, uh, we talked about the many reasons that HBO's Westworld failed. Now, one big reason was the lack of original source material from a novelist who carefully worked out what the world looked like and how events would proceed. Now, there is currently almost nothing in the news, he said, transitioning to a more political topic except coronavi uh, coronavirus stories, which is entirely appropriate. It's impossible mm -hmm. to take it all in. So personally, me, I'm looking for people who are doing exactly that kind of careful, novelistic thinking about this disaster. Um, back a million years ago, uh, when I was camping with my sister in uh, Arizona and her then husband, um, I brought along a paperback copy of Lucifer's Hammer with me by Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell, about a comet hitting the earth. And it really bothered my sister because it was so realistic. And it was. Mm. It was about a comet impacting the earth and what would happen and the floods that would happen and the, the collapse of the infrastructure and so on and so forth. I'm not recommending anyone read it. <laughs> believe me, you should be watching um, the Dave Matthews Band online. You should not be reading yes, Lucifer's right. Hammer. The reason that I uh, I think about that is how carefully... Uh, Niven and Pornell plotted out what would happen if, if a comet struck the Gulf of Mexico, the tidal wave that would go up the Mississippi River would be, you know, a mile high. Um, the the entire electrical grid of the world would be washed out. Um, you would have people. He had uh, scenes of, of people driving on deflated um, car tires along railroad tracks because everything was flooded. And what happens to people who need insulin? Mm -hmm. And on mm -hmm. and on and on and on and and gamed out what would happen to civilization if this happened and how civilization might recover. It is those sorts of thinkers that I think need to be brought to bear to tell the story of what's happening right now and what will probably mm -hmm. be happening tomorrow and a, a month from now and a year. No one really mm -hmm. knows. Two uh, years from now and how we rebuild. But right. how we rebuild and what the possible future can look like. It's the time for people with – Big ideas and a, a good sense of of grounded in reality, not you know just tossing bullshit fiction out. People who really do think these things through and game them out, and well, if this happens, then this happens, and this happens. What happens to? Um, I was reading an article today about um, a notary publics. Ah, how do you do notary remotely? Hmm, that's a good question. I never would have occurred to me to ask that, but someone thought about it and someone wrote an article about it. So. 
I, I'm very interested in people who think these things through on a sort of a large scale, because even if they're wrong, that kind of thinking is what we need right now. And it's sorely lacking from national leadership. There is no, yep. there's no one other than certain governors that we have already named who are talking about sort of how we're going to marshal resources, how we're going to deal with this crisis and what we are going to look back on in 10 years and think about this crisis. And how, and how mission one is saving lives, yes. not reopening. Absolutely. Nail salons. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that doesn't mean that we don't want the, you know, people working in nail salons to have enough income to eat no. and have, have the rent canceled while this is going on. But the priority is saving lives. Yeah. As long as we, we have good, go we have some good governors doing that, and then we have a president who wants particularly to punish women, yes. to punish women governors who are, you know, not being pleasant. We we should mention, speaking of books and and plans and novelizations and so forth, uh, there was a playbook. There was yes, a there White was. House playbook. Yes, there was written out guidelines for what to do in just this particular event. Yes. And uh, the Trump administration ignored it. Threw it in the trash. Ignored it completely. And uh, mm -hmm. because it's it was Obama. Right. You know, and Obama he's did. here to undo everything Obama did. Congratulations, you did that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was one tweet from a uh, woman in the moon mm -hmm. uh, who wrote, I swear Obama could have left a vaccine to cure COVID-19 in the desk drawer. Yes. <laughs> and Trump would have thrown it out. Yes. Yep. We would also like to, since we do have this enormous podcast out here in the middle America, to use our relatively small but but heartfelt uh, megaphone to thank our listeners very much. Absolutely. Um, for Absolutely. all the cards and letters and the Obama coffee we got, which was a lovely, moderately flavored coffee, which we enjoyed I very still much. Have, I have the bag in front of me yes. because we're going to keep the bag. We are. Absolutely. Coffee's gone. We're going to keep the bag. And uh, wanna... It is from... Can I say what? Oh, where yeah, it's from? I was going to say, please, please tell people where it's from. It's from Moschetti. Uh -huh. uh, and this person sent it to us from California. It is Obama blend, one third Kenya, one third Indonesia, and one third Kona from Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and then underneath it says 100% made in the USA. That's right. That's right. <laughs> and uh, we also want to thank uh, the people who've sent us goodies, send us uh, books and. Uh, just, I said, stamp, and that was the one this yesterday it just about made me cry somebody sent us uh postage stamps mm -hmm. and said uh in a note hello to a couple of my favorite people i received a thank you postcard from you the other day so <laughs> thoughtful of you <laughs> so enclosed are some stamps for you to keep up your good deeds i hope your family is well we just need to stay in our routine and keep on plowing forward Hopefully we will be out of the woods soon, although we'll be dealing with the remnants of this for months, maybe years to come. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making me smile during these trying times. Sincerely, Bob. And Bob, thank you for the stamps. Uh, breaks my heart a little because my grandmother used to send stamps. And uh, it breaks my heart to send postcards now because I think, I mean, I, I hope everybody's doing okay. I really do. And we, we really do. I um... And I write these postcards to listeners and I think, I hope. They're not sick. Yeah, we do. I hope it gets there and they're healthy. And we love you all so much, mm -hmm. guys. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to cry. No. <laughs> I'm not going to no. cry. But well, uh, we love you all so much. Yeah, yeah, we do. And it's um, uh, uh, this got me thinking about my mom who passed away, as as most of you know, uh, over Thanksgiving last year. It was respiratory. It was she yeah. was getting better, getting better, getting better. Then, um, and I visited her, and she, we, my sister, my brother, and I all, you know, responded to the bat signal. Went to my sister's house where she lived, and we got her medication all set up, and got her, you know, got her logged into BritBox, and you know, got her, got her going on everything. And, and my mom's just inhumanly efficient uh, retired teacher, so she had lists for everything. Um, and and the the home health care workers came out, and the respiratory therapists came out to the top of the mountain where my sister lives. Right. And and right. in the snow, literally in the snow. Um, and she got all the care you could possibly hope for. Um, and from, from loving professionals, from incredibly from, loving professionals, yeah. non-contagious. It just and then, you know, we all went back to our homes and then she took a, a very fast turn for the worst um, and and died. Uh, and she was in her upper 80s. She was. She was. Uh, I'm so grateful that to the very end, she knew who everyone was yeah. around her. You know, she was uh, as sharp as a tack and uh, 
Well, and, we were crazy about her. And we, well, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, but she got to die with family around her, um, enjoying the very best care you could possibly imagine from incredibly skilled technicians. And it 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 is incredibly sad to me, uh, and I might start crying that mm-hmm. so many people are going to be denied that that they're yep. not going to be able to be with their families, that they're not going to be able to get the best care available, that those people who are doing, who did respiratory care for my mom are probably going to end up doing, resp- trying to do respiratory care for 20 people at once. Right. No equipment, not enough time, not enough funding, because not that this wouldn't have been bad, but this is a catastrophe. And it's a catastrophe because of one political party and one leader in this country. The blame for this is theirs. And it, infuriates me that Mm -hmm. that my mom got to pass away in her own home among her family uh very tough i mean she she it was respiratory so it was difficult to be with her um right but she got everything you could possibly want and uh and left this world with great dignity and 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 that will be denied to people due to the criminal negligence and narcissism and 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 stupidity and 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 that that just kills me. That just kills me. It it it. I, I think of her a lot, and in on those terms, um, she got to go in the best way possible, and so many people are going to have to go in the worst way possible because of this asshole. Um, now, how do I turn the corner on that comment to talk about anything else? I don't really know. Well, uh, let's, let's do a news roundup. Well, I'll tell you let's what. Go let's go from here. To- let's let's ask you guys for some feedback for some letters. For some email. Yeah. How about yeah. how about you all send us a little something in the mail um, or via email? Just how are you doing? How are you doing? Um, I don't want to get into any political fights right now over over anything particularly other than um, what how what's the most efficient way to get Republicans the hell out of the way so that we can do things. Um, yeah. But tell us how you're doing. How, tell us how you're coping. And I can't guarantee and, that we'll and be aware that as far as the primaries are concerned, we've already voted. So we voted. Like, we voted. Our whole family has voted. Yes. And our primary yeah. is over. Yeah. So uh, we're not talking about that. No. But, but we want to hear from you about how you're doing. And uh, if there's something we can talk about or something that we can say that w- would make you feel better, or if there's something that we could do that'll make you feel better, we want to hear from you. Um, we got a call this week. You weren't home, but we got a call from uh, Betsy Dirksen Londrigan's campaign. We did. She's running for Congress in Illinois 13. She won the primary mm-hmm. uh, and um, she wasn't calling for a vote. The The young woman who was calling us was not calling for a vote or a donation. She was calling from on behalf of the campaign to see if there was anything we needed. Mm-hmm. And I think about using a phone list to do that. Mm-hmm. And I just am so grateful and humbled by that. By that. that was just amazing. Uh, you know, there's, she's not out there campaigning because she can't be, no. right? No. But she told her uh, phone bank to call people in her district to find out if they need anything. And that is a remarkable thing. And I really hope she's our congresswoman come January. Uh, I also uh, want to mention in the good news department. Uh, yeah. I could be angry about this, but I'm glad that we have, we as a country have discovered millions of N95 masks sitting in warehouses. Mm-hmm. Um, some some expired, some not. I'm not sure what expiration means exactly. I think it's just the elastic band that goes around the ear, which can be replaced, but it's certainly better than bandanas. So somebody decided to go into the giant Indiana Jones warehouse and start opening shit up. And found, yes, oh my right. God, there's all these masks that are in short supply that no one knows, et cetera. All I can say is I worked in government. Um, we had to account for every dollar we spent oh, and yeah, everything yeah. was documented and everything was where it was supposed to be. And and we knew exactly how many pencils were in the, were in the cabinet. I don't know who stuck millions and millions of masks in a warehouse and forgot about them. Um, but that person needs to be... Um, um, investigated, called forward, um, whatever. I'm glad they found them, and mm-hmm. I think it's a, I think it's a, 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 it's a small miracle that they did. And I sincerely hope they can be, be rushed back into use. Um, once again, you know, during World War II, we made enough aircraft to blacken the skies. Um, yeah. I am quite sure that if anyone else were in charge of this country, factories would be cranking up ventilators 
by the tens of thousands right now. And and we would be allowing people to 3D print whatever parts are, are actually safe to do that. Yes. And uh, we would be eliminating patent protections mm-hmm. for people who want to make a profit off of it. And uh, yeah, there would be things that would be different. That's not the world we live in. No. Here's the world we live in. Donald Trump says there's no way he'll cancel the Republican National Convention in August because of the coronavirus. Uh, now, Fra- this is a problem for the DNC, too. I want to say, I, first of all, I find it remarkable that they asked Trump about this. That tells you yeah. the world about the fascist Republican Party and the fact that it's one guy leading the whole thing down the sewer. The DNC has to do a major rules change to not hold a convention. They, they're they working on that, is my understanding. Yeah. It's it. The problem is, of course, it's a huge loss of free airtime for the yes. parties. Yes, but tough shit. Yeah, tough know? shit. Tough shit. It's it's also a huge loss of revenue for the city that uh, where it'll be held, and we understand that. But tough shit. S- sorry, <clears throat> sorry, that's too bad. Yeah. And as as I wrote, this is a wonderful time to think about shortening the whole presidential campaign yeah. season yeah. <laughs> by half. Uh, maybe you have six multiple state mega primaries and then you're done. Mm-hmm. You know, some countries do have presidential leadership elections in six weeks. You can do it. It's been done. Uh, you can do most of it online with free airtime for legitimate candidates to hold a town hall. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would be a far better use of CNN airtime than having uh someone from left and right black ants and red ants in a jar shaking it up yeah you know and and if you can if you can point a camera at an empty podium waiting for a liar to come lie to the american people during a pandemic you know what you can do you can cover virtually the the nomination of presidential candidates in a responsible and cheerful way and and show Mm -hmm. americans democracy still at work show us that our country has not fallen apart that that how we do things in this country is proceeding and that we can still hold a goddamn election uh, come hell or high water. Right. Um, in addition to throwing out the NSC playbook that was given to them by the Obama administration that showed them exactly how to handle a pandemic, the Trump administration fired more than two-thirds of the staff working at a key U.S. public health agency operating in China. Leading up to the coronavirus outbreak, staff at the CDC's Beijing office was slashed from roughly 47 people to 14 people since Trump took office. The CDC has worked in China for the last 30 years. So to get it this wrong, the Trump administration had to ignore its own intelligence agencies telling them something is happening in China that you need to pay attention to. Quit sucking up to their president and pay attention to what we're telling you because something bad is coming our way. He chose to suck up to a dictator rather than to listen to his own intelligence people. And the Trump administration blocked a joint statement from G7 countries on the coronavirus. And part of the argument was that the U.N. Security Council was to refer to the pandemic as the Wuhan virus. Yeah. Uh, that that was an item on the U.S., our country's want list. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> okay. Hey, well, hey Blue Gal. <laughs> I'm going to give you a big old hug after this and a big old smooch after this. And we're not going to social distance at all. We don't social distance at all. No, but, well, uh, we're all under the same roof. So, you know, there you go. Uh, that's that's family. Hey, uh, we love you guys. Mm-hmm. And we're thinking about you. You're in our thoughts and we care. So we'd love to hear from you again. Our P.O. Box, which Drift Class is picking up after hours. Yes, I am. Uh, waiting until the post office closes to go there. Um, but he is doing that. It's uh, P.O. Box 9133. Springfield, Illinois, 62791. Mm-hmm. Uh, you address it to the Professional Left podcast. That's that's the mail that goes into that box. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a bank account with that on it and everything. So that's that's our professional name, the Professional Left podcast. Put the, put the uh, P.O. box on there and mail it to us, anything we want to mail us. And uh, our email address is proleftpodcast at gmail.com. And we would love to hear from you. Each week, we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitties, plural, are Snowball and Eleanor. Mm. Please note that they are sitting on a giant hand-knit cushion. And this hand-knit cushion is very important because it's large and it's cushy. (laughs) (laughs) And we have cats like that here who go, 
oh, you're in the middle of knitting this? That's nice. That's nice. I'm going to sit on it. One side, people, <laughs> one side. And of course, Snowball and Eleanor eat freshly poured cat food, our fake sponsor. Whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your cat will sit on the kitchen floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Snowball and Eleanor and their cushion at our Facebook page or website. And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, where you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Hey, go Postal Unions. Go Delivery Guys. We yeah. love you guys. Yeah. All of you. Delivery Every day. women, delivery men. Every, Every day, day they come to our housekeeping civilization going. Uh, you know, you know right. who else did that? Garbage men. Picked up our garbage and recycling this week. Wow. You know? God bless them. Yep. We... Re we Reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service Go Postal Union's letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you cannot still afford to buy an espresso-based <laughs> beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is what we do every week, and we will be doing this every week uh, through this crisis. Yeah. Health willing. We'll be here. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, before you get your big hug and kiss, yeah. how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Oh, but look, the Internet Kitties urge all Americans to be like Internet Kitties. Get lots of sleep and shun everybody let's think about living let's think about loving let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the popping and the loving loving dubbing let's forget about the whine and the crying the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife let's think about living let's think about life Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license, copyright 2019-2020, DGBG Productions.